So we're thinking about being different today. How to be church, we need to be different from the world. Carlo Tobaldo was born into an Italian family. He had a great heritage, but it was fading fast. And, and the greatness of previous generations uh, had, had drifted away. And the, this family had fallen uh, out of favor in many ways. And after his studies, which he didn't do very well in, Carlo decided to emigrate to America. He arrived in Boston. And in, in his own words, I had two dollars fifty in my pocket and a million dollars in hope and he was resourceful and he soon ended up in the banking industry and with a cheerful attitude that he could uh, woo anyone and his ability to speak four languages he soon hit upon his idea to make his fortune he loved money and his ba- business plan that he offered was very attractive he invited people to invest in his securities exchange company. He said, if you give me your money within 90 days, I will give you double what you have given me. I'll give you 100% interest in three months. Well, that sounded very attractive. And in the first uh, month, he had $1,800. 18 investors saying, here's $100, give me back 100 more. And these investments began to flow in to uh, this uh, fund that Carlo uh, led and all with the promise of incredible profit. And the early investors did get their 100 plus another 100. And they told their friends and more and more heard about it. Uh, And Carlo was offering this to everyone far and wide, anyone he could find. He offered it to the shoeshine boy on the street corner, just a dollar, and he would get two dollars back. And he offered it to the great uh, businessman of his day. However, within a year, the company collapsed and the investors lost around to 20 million pounds. In today's money, that's about 250 million pounds was lost. Carlo Tobaldo's anglicized name is Charles Ponzi. That was the first Ponzi scheme. There were no investments that he was making. He was using the investments of later investors to pay back the original investors. And as they began to pile in, he began to default on some of those original investments. He was getting rich while everyone else was getting poor. And it was all a con. It was a deception. Ponzi himself ended up a broken man physically and mentally. He had suffered a heart attack. He was going blind and he spent the last of his days in total poverty. And Ponzi schemes exist even to this day. They continue to offer people a huge investment, huge return on their investment, if only they would invest. I'm sure you've had emails to that effect. Which all goes to show, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. Even the lies that Ponzi was telling came back to bite him personally. And Paul, writing in AD 55, says to the church, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. There are phrases and pictures that we find in the New Testament that immediately take us back to the Old Testament. Uh, In the beginning is one you find it in John's Gospel. It takes us straight back to Genesis. When we think of this phrase, do not be deceived, it takes us straight back to Genesis 3. And Paul wants us to make that link when he says, do not be deceived. It's a watchword for all time. Because deception goes back to the beginning of the Bible, chapter 3. Adam and Eve, as you know, were in the Garden of Eden. And up slithered the serpent and began tempting Eve. The serpent encouraged Eve to eat from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil so that she might become like God. It all sounded so good. Wouldn't you like the opportunity, Eve, to become like God? The the concept was wonderful. The fruit looked even more appealing. 
So as you know, Eve ate from the tree and shared some of the fruit with her husband. If it looks too good to be true, it probably is. And this was another Ponzi scheme. And God came walking in the cool of the evening. who called to Adam and Eve, where are you? And they were hiding because now they knew they were naked. And that now they knew shame. And again, it's a, a word that Paul uses in this, in this chapter, shame. And God turned to Adam and, and asks Adam, why have you eaten from the tree? And like many husbands, he blamed his wife. Turning to Eve, the Lord demanded, why, what is this you have done? To which she replied, the snake deceived me and I ate. So we hear Paul's uh, warning ring out to the Corinthian church, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. So who was seeking to deceive the church at Corinth? It was still that great deceiver, Satan, who was wanting to lure them away, using culture and the world to help in his work. So Paul is saying to the church, don't be deceived by Satan. Don't be deceived by the culture you're in. You need to be different from the culture in which you live. And that's an evergreen warning that we need to hear today in the 21st century. Paul had brought these believers to faith in Christ two years before writing this letter. He was exasperated that they hadn't grown spiritually. They were still babies. And he's bringing this teaching to, to the, the, the church that they need to be different. The church can never take its standards from the world. It, it can never rely on the world's ways to live out uh, fellowship life. It can only take its standards from God and his church. And this uh, teaching might seem re- offenses and repugnant to some or naive and foolish to others. But just as you need a fixed point when you're navigating on the sea, we as believers need a fixed point when we are navigating our way through life. And for the follower of Jesus, that can only be Christ himself and his word. So having said that the the Corinthians were were babies needed uh, milk teaching, he gives them milk teaching last time in chapter 5 we heard of his milk teaching that these spiritual babies had to show they were uh, not immoral they were saved from being immoral they were saved for holiness and their standards of morality had to be different from the world and here in chapter 6 he shows them and begins to to talk about not being like the world in respect of arguments and disputes they were, they were falling out with each other, but it was ending up in the law courts. And Paul uh, doesn't mince his words as he castigates them. He said, if any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? That is a shame on you. He goes on to, to show that we, will, we are competent to judge the world. As followers of Jesus, we are entrusted to judge the world for its sin. And we therefore have the ability, certainly, to sort out trivial matters and disputes in the church. You might have seen the, the news yesterday where, or, or in the week where in the Exeter Mosque, there's been a dispute and, and they've fallen out with each other, some of the leaders, some of the members, and they're calling in the police. And they're calling in the lawyers and they're trying to resolve their dispute in in worldly ways. So how do we in the church sort out our disputes? The answer is simple. Go back to the teaching of Jesus. You'll find it in Matthew 18 where we are to settle matters of disputes directly, face to face. Not in gossip, not in backbiting, but go to the person. If someone has sinned against you, go and share it with them and talk it through and see if it can be resolved. If it can't be, take two more witnesses along. Not to back you up, but to be objective and say, what is going on here? And if the, the person in, in yourself still can't resolve your issues, take it to the church meeting 
Because that's where we can resolve our disputes ultimately if we can't sort it out face to face. And that carries on to this day. Thankfully, our church meetings are seldom about resolving disputes, but more often about discerning God's guidance. But either way, our wisdom is found in united insight, working together in the power of God's Spirit to say, how can we resolve this difference? The church needs the church meeting. And that's one of the reasons I'm a Baptist, because I believe that together we have uh, God's insight together. When we, when we discern what he is saying, when we vote, when we are clearly guided in one direction, we sense that is what God is saying. And sorry, but those who were not sensing that have not been guided by God. And, and I thank uh, God that, that we can work this way. Because in, in other streams of church, it can be down to a leader to call all the shots and make all the decisions. Well, I'm sorry to say, I don't even trust myself that much, let alone another leader to have all the authority in a, in a local church. And so, together, we can find great wisdom and have the Lord's guidance under his Holy Spirit but only when we deliberately seek it, only when we say, God, will you lead us and guide us in these ways? So when it comes to disputes, Paul is saying, do not be deceived. Be different from the world. Do it God's way, not the world's way. Do it in a spirit of love and unity, forgiving as you have been forgiven. But there's a bigger issue that Paul is building up to, and we find it, verse 9 and 10. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Whoa, that's a a strong statement, isn't it? Probably not one you'd want to stand up in the middle of uh, Soho and say, or, or in the middle of Brighton, or come to that even in Axminster. Would you want to stand up and publicly say that? Commentator Phil Moore writes this, homosexual sex is still the sin that sets the church at odds in its culture and even sets the church at odds with itself. We can't agree with the, ch- with the world on this one, but there are times when we cannot even agree with parts of the church on this one. Some in the church say that homosexual sex is is not sinful at all. We have bishops and and church leaders promoting the welcome of gay uh, people into congregations and into leadership, saying they have nothing to repent about. It's all in their genes. It's not their fault. It's just the way the world is. There's no sin here. I say Ponzi scheme to that. Others in the world say that homosexual sex is despicable. And that people who engage in it aren't really saved and will be forever damned. And somewhere along the way, these believers have lost all sense of God's grace and compassion for the lost. And to them, I say, Ponzi scheme. It will come crashing down. And I believe Paul says to both extremes of that debate, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Moore, again, says that the homosexual community remains one of the least reached tribes in the Western community. Gay people, people who have alternative uh, views on sex, uh, are the least reached by the church here in the West. And somehow we need to address that. Probably there's someone in your family or your circle of friends who is gay. I know there is someone in my family, in my extended family. And if you want to reach them with the gospel, keep them in your family, keep them in your circle of friends, love them and forgive them because you are loved by God and forgiven by him. And Paul himself refuses to place homosexual sin in a separate category to many others. He doesn't separate it from heterosexual sin. And he's, he includes it with immoral people, he, whether they're straight or gray, gay. He includes it with adulterers. 
He includes it with those who revere idols, those who are thieves, those who are greedy, those who are slanderers, those who are drunkards, those who are swindlers. He brings them all into the same category and says they're all sins that offend the living God. And those who commit them have been deceived. They have been deceived. And we need not to be deceived. So how do we press forward? If we accept sinners as they are, demanding no change, then we've been deceived. If we reject sinners as they are and hate them for their failings, then we've been deceived. The love of God calls us to be different from the world, to show love and grace without compromise of the truth. And the great deception continues on today in many various guises and disguises. Take the recent debates about gender. Again, go back to Genesis. What does it say? God created them in his own image, male and female. He created them. Now, there's a a minute uh, minority of people who are born intersex, and and we, we recognize that. But mainly people are born male and female. The Bible tells us that. And that is not what the world is telling us. I'll show you a a clip. uh, And and the researchers there say the NHS recognized six genders. Our our National Health Service says there are six different genders. More alarming than that, the BBC have released some teaching material for schools that says there are over 100 genders. 100 genders. Here's someone who wishes to discuss this, so bear with him if he's not your cup of tea. And quite often he's not mine. You are transgender. I, well, I Can we have a bit louder, please? From male to right. female, but I don't... I've, I've never referred to myself as transgender, and if I did, I think my friends would go ballistic. Um, my opinion is there are... Two genders, male and female. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you're not lucky enough to be born into the right one, so you transition into the one that you Which suit the most. Which seems to me eminently sensible, and I have complete respect for people mm. that do that. It's not an easy process no. physically, psychologically, emotionally, or any of those things. I salute you for your common sense. Now, let's bring you into this equation. <laughs> you think it is right. How do you identify? I'm a man. That's right. right. So, and yeah. gender? What are you? Uh, I'm a cisgendered man. What, what does, does that mean? Cis mean? So that means if you were, so you were born a woman, and therefore you still identify as a woman. So you're a cisgendered woman. I okay. would say. And that's what? because of my physical. That's because femaleness. You identify with how you what, were born what am originally. I? Well, I assume you're a cisgendered. I'm not man, a cis if, anything. If I, if I may assume. I'm not a cis anything. Well, I'm just a, I'm just a man. Well, no, but you're a cisgendered man. No, I'm not a cisgendered anything. But hang on. What does cis mean? Well, that means that you were born the way that you identify no, now. No, I'm just born a man. But someone who transitions Why are you to insisting on calling me something I'm not? Well, you can refer to yourself as just a man if, 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 if you like. But I think most people identify as male or female, man or woman. That's right? right. The vast majority of people. But that doesn't mean that there aren't other people who identify differently. There, there are a hundred different genders on this BBC list, apparently. Mm. Right? One of them is two-spirit person, polygender. Pan-gender, neutroids, intergender. I have to say, do you know what they mean? I have no idea what they mean, no. and I'm part... Right, well, I'm luckily we have the world the expert community. here. What is any of this? <laughs> Look, I can't... Don't ask me to list off... What's a two-spirit person? Uh, I think that's someone who identifies with their, their native background into their gender. Do you not think right. this is just like a vibe that somebody's having? Like when you tick a list, male or female, doing your passport or something, mm. is this not just... This is just how they are. This is just a bit of a vibe. Do you know what a porogender is? Uh, I, no. They're very so sorry actually, about Even it. though you support what the BBC is doing. This, by the way, this is the public is broadcaster. Is No, I don't know. Just the public broadcaster paid for by mm. us with the licence fee is now instructing children. There are a hundred genders they can identify as. 
You have come to defend it, and you don't know what half of these are. But hang on, Piers. Ignorance isn't a defence. You're the ignorant one, and you're the one defending it. Well, Piers, you're the one that doesn't know what it is as well, of course. I'm about to tell but, you. Do you know Apoor what... Aporogender is a fairly new word stemming from the Greek apor, meaning separate. Aporogender is an umbrella term, meaning a gender separate from male, female, and anything in between, while still having a very strong and specific gendered feeling. Mm. That latter part is key, then, distinguishing it from agender. Is this Which how is they're somebody explaining it to are, children? Uh, by the way, can you explain that to me? What does that mean? Well, that means that someone identifies differently to you, and that's what is at the no, heart. No, no, no. Can you explain that's what apora gender is, which it? is one of the hundred genders that kids now have to be? What is it? Well, how good? You know, it's not, it's not, sort of a, it's not university challenge. I've just I've told you on. what it is. No, but this is for children, Benjamin. Right. This is, the ch this is what, my problem with it. When I, I was a child. I think it is university level. Yeah. And to, for us to get our heads around a hundred different gender identities. Mm. And I think Nicole makes a really good point. It's actually is about personality. There we go. As Piers Morgan says, the BBC Corporation, is pay, who we're paying, has produced this material that they will teach to our children that there are a hundred genders in our schools. Our children, our grandchildren, our nieces and nephews will be told this in the schools. And then when they come here, we'll say, that's not true. And who will they believe? You try telling my seven-year-old daughter that something the teacher allegedly said is not right. We have a battle on our hands. Do not be deceived, says Paul. There's pressure on the world to believe this sort of stuff too. And we should treat with love and grace those people, who, whatever they think their agenda is, but still hold to our, our understanding of the Bible. They have been deceived. And God has made us as we are, and that God doesn't do mistakes. He made us male, and that is how he intends me to be. But let's not stop there, because Paul doesn't. He says, do not be deceived, sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, slanderers, swindlers. This is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Paul reminds the church that they used to be some of these things, but they're not anymore. In fact, he could say he was some of those things. He was slandering the church. He was participating in the murder of Christ's followers. But he's not like that anymore because of the love and grace of and forgiveness of Jesus. He's reminding them if they were once like that, but have come to ask Jesus to be their Lord and Savior, then they're not like that anymore. They are a new creation. They've been washed purified by Jesus. It's a picture again of baptism, which is why it's so important. We've been sanctified, made holy. When your Father, Heavenly Father looks at you, he doesn't see your sin because that's dealt with. He sees you purified and sanctified, made holy because of what Jesus has done. And we've been justified. Jesus justified the, the justice of God by taking his sin on him. And putting his sinlessness on us. The danger is that as believers today, we may find it hard to shake off those images of who we are or who we once were. And that's the point. You were uh, you like that once, but you're not now. And any labels that are put on us no longer apply. Sexually immoral, idolater, adulterer, homosexual thief, greedy, alcoholic, liar, swindler. They no longer apply. That's who we once were. I believe, therefore, it's possible for a person to be gay and yet saved. I believe that someone can be trans and yet a child of God, an adulterer, a swindler, a liar, a greedy person, and yet be in the kingdom of God. But they're just deceived about who they are. Because it says, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. It doesn't say get your sex in, in, in the right way. It doesn't say stop lying. It doesn't say stop being greedy. It just says believe and you will be saved. And go on being transformed, says the Bible, by the renewing of your mind. 
start to undo that great deception that's been going on in your life. The only label a believer can wear is a new one, that you're a child of God, that you're holy and pure, that you're a world changer, that you're the light of the world, that you're loved and forgiven, that you're a peacemaker, that you're a healer. Do not be deceived. See yourself not in the way of the world, but through the eyes of a loving father. And so to go back to the beginning, Charles Ponzi deceived many Americans of his day. And then he also was taken in in his love of money, thinking that would be the answer to his happiness. Satan deceived Adam and Eve in their day. And they too ended up broken and far from God. And Satan and culture go on deceiving our Western culture even today even impacting the church. But we are called to be different. We're called to be Christ-like, combining truth and grace and love together, reaching out to the lost while not abandoning our central truth. This sort of teaching will have us vilified, will have us mocked, will have us uh, taken to court. Even this week, more medical people have been taken to court and lost their jobs because they hold to what they feel is, is a matter of faith and the truth that they see in the Bible. I've expressed my views through studying scriptures prayerfully over the years, and this is where I've got to. But even if I were to say this out in the, in the open, I too could find myself in court for these views. G.K. Chesterton said an interesting thing. Every man knocking on the door of a brothel is seeking God. Every man knocking on the door of a brothel is seeking God. I think that's true. I think every person seeking sex outside of marriage is somehow seeking God. Every person thinking that, that money will make them happier is seeking God. Everyone who looks to tell lies and live by lies is seeking God. They're looking for God, but in all the wrong places. So who do you think is going to tell them? Isn't it us? Isn't it we who are seeking not to be deceived by this world, not to be deceived by the enemy? We need to go and reach out to the lost even more when the world is telling lies. You know, if you saw someone being scammed by a Ponzi, Ponzi scheme, wouldn't you go to, to try and uh, persuade them not to fall for it? You wouldn't hate them, would you? You wouldn't say, you're disgusting, you're an idiot. You would try to win them over and say, look, you know, yes, if you click and give your bank details, you will be scammed. You'll come to them in love. And let's be different from the world. Let's be Christ-like. Let's use love in order to win the lost. Whatever their sexuality, whatever their gender, whatever their, their viewpoint in life, they're probably knocking on the, the door of God and looking for him. And they need to be guided home. So let's help. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to... Move now to communion, and it's always a joy to come to the place of communion and welcome others. But before we do, I want to welcome in uh, two new members. It's exciting to do that.